Welcome to this Simply the Truth special with me, uh, Doug Harris. And it's the second in our fascinating uh, series on hard talk with Seventh Day Adventists. And I really want to welcome again and thank Victor Holbert for being with us. Oh, it's a joy to be with you, Doug, as always. <laughs> yeah, you almost said that with a straight face, Victor. <laughs> <laughs> you brought me down to Spain and the sunshine and the beach. I mean, the, the difficulty was simply coming in the studio, but and now talking I'm here. To me. <laughs> You're put up with it. Communication Director of the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, ever since we've had your programs on the channel, and th th we've had different ones of them uh, on there, um, we got a steady stream of criticism. You shouldn't have these Adventists on there. They're heretics and, and, and they're everywhere in between, you know. So, Which is interesting because we've had a steady stream of praise. <laughs> so it balances out some way. It does. You, you must <laughs> send us yours sometime and we can read them. But the aim of this program, which of course you're, you, you know about and you've been very gracious to, to accept, is we really want to get down to what is the heart of Adventism. So... I, I hope I'm going to ask you some very difficult questions. Um, and we really just want to explore Adventism. May maybe there are different aspects. Maybe some people are saying one thing and some people are saying another. Whatever it is, we want to find out uh, con concerning it. Now, we looked at, in the first program at the whole area of salvation, if we're saved by grace, by works, etc., and that's available for anybody that wants to. And that to, is the most important it. part of it as well. That's Absolutely. the core. Absolutely, yes. and that's why we started there, uh, because that uh, if we begin wrong, of course we're you know we have no hope. If we begin right, possibly we can go wrong, as we looked at certain areas of that um, as well. But it, as you say, that is the core. And, and, and really, in one sense, that's, of course, what we're all about, whatever denomination we are from, from that aspect. Um, what I want to get on to uh, in, in, in this program is, is, is the whole area of, uh, of the great controversy. And, of course, the controversy is whether you say con controversy or controversy anyway. <laughs> I'll let you decide, but I'll say controversy today if it okay. keeps you happy. Okay, well, we'll, we'll I'll, I'll go for, I'll go for controversy. <laughs> no, but the, of, of what the, the, the Seventh-day Adventists call the great controversy, and we're, we're going to be looking at that. But, of course, Ellen White um, actually wrote a book on that, and some of the aspects of the teaching of the great controversy are in that book. I, I know it's also very biblical, um, and we will be looking at that as well. But I really wanted to begin with Ellen White because one of the criticisms that certainly has been thrown at the Adventist Church and a lot of the questions that I'm, I'm going to bring you come out of emails that we, that we have sure. received is this whole area of, of, of Ellen White. Um, you very much still um, underline her as, as being a prophet, certainly in, in, in the, the book there, you have Seventh-day Adventist Believe, um, very much underlined. Uh, spirit of prophecy, very important. Ellen White really typified this. I guess the first question I have for you, Victor, is have you checked out her teaching against the Bible and actually found it to be true on the central issues? It's, it's a strange question to ask because if I'd checked it out and found it not to be true, <laughs> of the two books, the Bible is the one that I'm going to follow. Right. And, and that's very clear. And I think any Adventist of whatever persuasion or culture you'd come from will always say to you, the Bible is the primary source of our teaching and our faith. Ellen White described herself as the lesser light that leads to the greater light, and the greater light is the Bible. I would hope, and, you know, if, if I found her, and, and you'll, you'll argue that with me this evening, you know, <laughs> if you come up with a whole list of things where she is wrong and the Bible is right, then, um, you know, this, well, this is a little book of hers, I would have to throw it away. Yeah. Whereas, in fact, I find it a very helpful little book. I mean, what, what I find is, indeed, a number of things she said, and, and certainly I, I would not like to sit here and say everything she said was wrong, because I think a number of things she said, a number of things she wrote, um, were true. But and, and I think you'd have to say, first of all, that the majority of what she wrote was uplifting Jesus Christ. That was her aim. I mean, this, this little book, 
which is probably the most distributed book that she wrote, Steps to Christ, is all about guiding people on a journey to Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It's about forgiveness, it's about redemption, it's about salvation. The next most sold book of hers is The Desire of Ages, which is based on the four gospels. It's her accounts of, of the life of Jesus, expanding um, some of the things that Jesus was saying, explaining the parables and all of And you know, you cannot read that book of whatever faith you come from without a warmness in your heart drawing you closer towards Jesus. And yet there are some quotes of hers which go to me, go to the heart of who she actually saw Jesus is. Now, of, 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 of yes, she, she, she talks about coming to know this Jesus. But for instance, I mean, in, in, in the spirit of prophecy, she, it, it, it actually says the father uh, then made known that it was ordained by himself that Christ his son should be equal with himself. It was ordained. In other words, you get the impression and, and there is one quote which is clear within a, a Seventh-day Adventist commentary where she says, the man Christ Jesus was not the Lord God Almighty. Now, when I read those, and please, if I'm quoting them out of context, put them in context. But can you see the problem that I and maybe others can have when, when we read such quotes from her, that it seems to downgrade the person of Jesus. Now, and, and uh, obviously, as evangelical Christians, we believe Jesus is God, fully Absolutely. God, fully man. Yes. There seems to be some question mark over whether she actually believed that or not. Well, I, th I think you have two things in there. One is that Jesus himself says, the Father and I are one, and yet they've clearly got different roles. Yes. And then you have Paul in Philippians chapter 2, talks about Jesus who, who was God, who came down, and you've got that beautiful poem in the beginning of, of the chapter there, who um, you know, became a slave, literally, who died and then was exalted again. And, and you see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as all part of the Trinity, mm -hmm. but with different roles, different functions. Absolutely. Now, you've thrown that quote at me, and obviously I haven't got no. the book sitting in front of me no. to look at the context of the way she's saying it, but I, I would suspect, if you look at the context, what she's saying is God Almighty has this particular role. Jesus Christ has this particular role. Um, if you look in, in her writings, I think you'll find that she, she says Jesus was as much involved with the creation of this world as we know it as, as the Father was. Mm -hmm. um, you see Genesis 1 in the plural in terms of the Godhead, not in the singular. Uh, and she constantly elevated the role of Jesus. You know, there, there were those back in the early days of Adventism, there were some, some of them that didn't actually believe in the deity of Jesus. They, they saw him as, as somewhat less than the Father. She fought against that. And she was very keen to, to uplift Jesus. It's, again, and immediately I think we're, we're going to come across something here which we are actually going to come across quite often in our conversation. You've just said it there. There were some in Adventism that actually did not believe that, yeah. that, that, that Jesus was God or in, fully in God. In early Adventism. In, yes. yes, okay. Um, where, where did that come yeah. from? I mean, because if... If the, if the belief, because much of the original belief, as I understand it, um, came out from Ellen White, I mean, the, much of it, and, and William Miller and others at the time. Um, now, if, if those things weren't there within her writings, where did that come from? You've got to get the history right. Go on then. The put me, you can put <laughs> me right any time you want, Victor. Yes. <laughs> An Adventist rose out of the Millerite movements. William Miller was never a Seventh-day Adventist. No, but he, um, was, a, he and, was a second Adventist, wasn't he? he, he so, yes, yeah. he was. Uh, and he had a lot that was, that was good and that was positive. He obviously got a number of things wrong. And in fact, when you look at some of his prophetic things, there, there were some in there that was quite wacko. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Ad Adventists grew out of, of the disappointment that happened when William Miller and his followers had prophesied that Jesus would come again October 22, 1844, and he, mm. he didn't. Um, and then a small group of Adventist believers 
you know, I thought we've, we've, we've got to study this more. We've got to see what happens. And you end up in, I think it's 1848, um, with a series of Bible conferences where there was very, very vigorous debate, you know, Bible thumping debate, um, where they didn't leave anything for granted. They, they, you know, you could go right back to the Nicene Creed or whatever you want to, and they wanted to go right through and look at all the doctrines and argued them out. I mean, the, the first Adventist believers were not Sabbath keepers, mm -hmm. but a Seventh-day Baptist came along and, and pointed out, I think, to Joseph Bates, one of the pioneers, um, you say that you're, you're following God, but you're not, you're not keeping the Sabbath. The Sabbath. You yeah. don't follow the fourth commandment. And, and they went and studied that. And so things progress. And there were some in that argy-bargy of arguments who didn't have the same level of respect for the deity of Christ that Ellen White and, and some of the others did. And so in that early process, that debate was there. But Adventists, certainly since 1888, and I think before that, I, I'm not a historian, um, very highly uphold the deity of Christ. Where then does this whole thinking come in that Jesus was also Michael the Archangel, because this does run through. Um, and and, 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 and I've, I've spoken with Adventists in, in, in the past. You yeah. still get this. Yeah. I, I really love to hear from you, Victor. Is Jesus Michael the Archangel? Are they one and the same person? The, the reason I'm asking, the reason I want to get down to it, is if they are, I, I would have to say, see, in my thinking... I would have to say, well, wait a minute, that, doesn't, that means that Jesus isn't fully God because, because he's an angel. Tell, tell us about Jesus and Michael. Well, we'll put, it, put it in another context first. When, when Abraham was sitting at the door of his tent and two strangers came and ate with him, mm -hmm. who were the strangers? Mm -hmm. Were they angels? Were they people that God had given a prophetic gift to? Was it Jesus? Um, if Jesus can come in human form, he can come as an angel. Um, that's a kind of background. Now, before you jump in at me, because I, <laughs> right. I, I know what I'm your bite, thoughts are. I'm biting my <laughs> tongue at the <laughs> bite, bite your tongue, indeed. Um, I'll let you finish. We, we discussed this on, on a program several years ago, yeah. and, and, and after that discussion, I went back and talked more with you know, people that are, are more deeply theological than I am. Adventists hold to the view that Jesus and Michael, the archangel, are the same person through looking in the book of Daniel, through looking in Jude, and seeing the role that Michael is, is undertaking at that time. However, we don't make it a point of doctrine. It's not some, you know, I, I've never heard a sermon on it. We don't argue about it. And if you have a different point of view to me on it, that doesn't mean that, um, you know, one of us is saved and the other is lost. I agreed, and, and it, it's, it's not initially a salvation issue. I mean, we've dealt with the salvation yeah. issues. And, and in fact, I think if you look in questions on doctrine, but don't quote me in case I'm wrong, um, I think it does say there that this is not a kind of doctrinal issue that we focused no, on. It, but it's, it's, it's not, yeah. but again, the, the, the thing is you've said is you, you talked with these people, and, and yes, it, it, it's there. You actually do believe he's, he, he, Jesus is Michael the Archangel, but it's not a doctrinal issue. But the very fact that you believe it, because again, when, when, when you go, yes, the, the, the angel, and there's, there's this angel of the Lord, in, but he's very special, the angel of the Lord. It, it's this uh, theophany, isn't it? It's, it, it's, it's an appearance of Jesus before. But Michael was ever a created angel. The angel of the Lord was the Lord himself manifest as an angel. That's very different because the moment you say Jesus is actually a, an angel, he becomes a created being, which does lessen Jesus' deity. Well, the word angel means messenger, doesn't it? Absolutely. I mean, we've, we've kind of given it a different meaning than what the Bible actually gives it. Jesus came to earth as a messenger. Um, when Michael appears in, in Daniel chapter 12, he's appearing giving a, a message. And I, I think to take it that because Adventists 
hold to the view that Michael and Jesus may be the same person, to then immediately jump to the conclusion that we're then saying Jesus was created is, is a leap that isn't there. Well, how, how, how can that be? I mean, I think you appreciate how I can make that jump and how others would make that jump. How can we not make that jump, Victor? Um, for, for instance, in Daniel, talking about Michael, it talks about him being one of the princes. But it talks about Jesus being the Prince of Peace. So in other words, in the very context of Daniel, where you have Michael, Jesus is the Prince, Dan, uh, uh, Michael is one of the princes. Now, I, I'm not you know, trying to, as you, as you know, I'm not trying to trip you up, I'm just trying to, to establish some of the things here. But how can we not jump to that conclusion that Jesus is a created being if Jesus is this specific angel called Michael? Is, isn't that just a nuance of language, though? Because, you know, at times we may say Prince Charles is one of the princes. At another time we say, well, he's the preeminent prince because he's going to become king, perhaps, maybe, one day. I'm not prophesying. <laughs> <laughs> and, I think, I, I think, and I think, you know, we, we may uh, no. be splitting hairs here. I, I, I don't know. Um, but, you know, what, whatever way you accept it, and, and I don't want to argue with you no, at length no, on no, it. No, we're not. No, we're not Ad Adventists say. would certainly say Jesus was not a created being, you know, and, and, and I know because from your background with simply the truth and, yes. and what you do dealing with, with other faith groups, that have I wouldn't problem, want you yes. to tie us in <laughs> to those other faith groups right. and, and, and get into some but strange can, can, theology. Can you understand maybe why people do put you? In, in, in with those other uh, groups because of that proclamation. And again, no, you don't teach it. But the very fact that it's there, e e even though it, that, 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 that it's not taught. And it's very interesting. I, I want to come on to, I, I know, the, a particular version of the Bible in a minute, which we're, we're, we're going to. But um, in, in, in Jude 9... Yes where it, 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 it actually, um, it talks uh, that this angel Michael, or archangel Michael, actually says, the Lord rebuke you, mm. Satan. Now, if... Did, it, didn't Jesus do that? Where? Um, when he was tempted. The three temptations yes. of he's, Christ. No, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. He, he didn't actually say, the Lord rebuke you. He, he spoke that word direct. Yeah. Yeah. You see, again, this, I, I suppose this is where, and, and uh, again, you, we can be talking about splitting hairs, but I, I suppose what I'm trying to do is twofold. One is to get what you believe, sure. but others maybe to help you maybe to see why we get emails from people saying this bunch are heretics um, because of issues like this, where to me, there's no way Michael can be the supreme almighty God in what he does and how he does it. And, and that really, I suppose, is, is where... And, and I, I understand your point of view. I, I, I would then equally say, you know, if you look in a book like this that explains our, our fundamental beliefs, I'm not even sure if Michael gets a mention I in it. I, I, I haven't looked to see. I, actually, I don't think he does. Uh, and, and so in the context of where Christians, where Adventists come within Christianity, to hone in on that right at the beginning of the program is probably doing a disservice to where, where Adventists are. Well, maybe, again, one of the reasons I did it, because it, is if we, we were talking about uh, Ellen White, sure. and, and you actually mentioned the desire of the ages as, yes. as, as being one, of, she actually clearly puts Michael, um, uh, she actually says on page 99 of the particular version I was looking at, there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, brackets Christ, your prince. Now, that to me, I, I, I have problems over, the, yes. over that, that she is putting Michael, oh, actually, that's Christ. You're, now, yeah. she's saying that in yeah. Desire of the Ages, one of the books yeah. which, which you mentioned. And I suppose that's why... I'm bringing it in yeah. it, because it is, it, it's there at the beginning. It is there, whether it's taught today or not, by your very admission, it's still there. And yeah. as I say, I, yeah. I, I just and, have and some problems. Agree. You know, it, it, it is there and it is part of, of Adventist belief, but it's not something where, you know, if, if you don't accept that Michael and Christ are the same, that doesn't mean we won't baptize you. Right. You know, it's not, 
it's not a crucial core center of our belief. But okay, right. as, as, as with many other Christians, there's there's the little things that we right. we debate on, and there's the major things that are really important right. that we focus on. Okay, yeah. Um, just so, so with all all of these things uh, in these programs, I, I'm talking with uh, Michael Holbert, uh, communication. Victor Holbert, you've Sorry, elevated Victor. me to an angel. I know, I have. Now, Thank yes. you. <laughs> It indeed, it is Victor Hall, but it is not Michael, and uh, uh, Communication Director of Seventh-day Adventists. And we are looking at the whole area of Adventism. I want to make the points. I'm allowing Victor to make the points. You then have to decide. Some of you watching these programs will have emailed me in, emailed Revelation TV in and said, we don't agree with this, we don't agree with that. You take what's being said and you look at it and decide for yourself. In this connection, and, and there is a, um, a, a moving on here with Michael, um, I, I want to talk about the Clear Word Bible. Now, many of the people watching this would never have heard about it. I have to confess, I hadn't heard about it until I got an email uh, uh, about it recently. First of all, how would you describe the Clear Word Bible? Um, by taking the last word off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there, there, are, there are some people within the Adventist church. Well, let, let, let me give a background. That's, do, that's probably do. better. Yes. Um, I think it's George Blanco. I can't remember his Christian name. But, but, but Blanco, who wrote the clear word, wrote it as a personal devotional exercise for himself. He never expected to publish it. Um, he's, a, he's retired now. He's, he's a theology professor at Southern Adventist University in Tennessee. He's got a vibrant experience with Jesus himself. If you listen to his stories, I mean, he went through the Second World War through prison camps and all sorts of things, and, and that helped his relationship with Jesus. He then did this devotional exercise for his own benefit, going through the Bible with the Hebrew and the Greek and saying, what does this mean for me personally? And he wrote this devotional book. He gave it to some friends and they looked at it and said, you should publish this. Uh, and so it was published and some people have called it the clear word Bible. Well, it's not a Bible. The Adventist church, as far as I'm aware, and you're no doubt going to quote at me now where, <laughs> where they have said it, um, but certainly we don't see it as a Bible. We see it as a devotional exercise, a personal paraphrase. And to sit and read it, it can be very encouraging. Yes. I, I have some problems with it, yes. but I have some problems with some other versions as well. And isn't, let me, you know, good, you're going to come good. in with a question. Let me say it is not the Adventist Bible. No. Um, if you go, the, the, the most recognized Bible that Adventists encourage for study at the moment is the New King James Version, where Andrews University, which is our major theological university, um, has produced an Andrews University study Bible with all sorts of guides and notes and things with it, and it is based on the New King James Version. Mind you, I have problems with the King James as yeah. well, but you know. <laughs> we won't go there. Just we won't go there today. I, I, yeah. No, co com coming back yeah. to the Clear Word Bible, yes. I, I accept what you say about it, and, and yes, it is not the official Adventist Bible, but it was an Adventist, a theological professor in an Adventist that college it, yes. that produced it. Therefore, I, I would be saying that out of what the paraphrase, and we accept that it's a paraphrase, it, it, it would be reflecting how he sees the word, how he sees as an Adventist, he sees the word. Um, it, it was actually uh, in, in the Adventist Review, um, they did say this that uh, in 2006, that the, the most popular paraphrases, so they mentioned paraphrases, uh, are the message, the clear word, and the living Bible. And so they actually, they actually did say that. So recognizing that the... Adventist Review is writing to an Adventist public. Yes. And, and so in the context of Adventist readers, then the clear word maybe comes up there. Yeah. Um, but there are a lot. I mean, for, for instance, okay, Alden Thompson, who is another Adventist theologian and, and somebody who's helped me in my spiritual journey. Um, he's, he's a retired professor at Walla Walla University in the northwestern United States. He and, and Blanco have a bit of an argy-bargy with each other. Mm. And, and um, Alden Thompson struggles with parts of the clear word because he says Blanco has taken some of the difficult passages and watered them down. And I think he has. 
um, you know, so, some of the bits where God's wrath is a bit preeminent, Blanco's kind of, you know, left Blanked it out it a little bit. <laughs> and, you know, to me, I'm, I'm always going to use a, right. a, a recognized version of the Bible, you know, a, across the, the board of Christianity. Um, and in fact, my preference is to use a variety of Bibles because, you know, I've got okay. an NIV in front of me yeah. that's got a little slant on it. The King James has another slant and the, you know, we put it together or we try the original Greek and Hebrew that I'm not quite so good at. No. Okay. And my, I, 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 none of that, uh, of, of the watering down the wrath of God uh, was, was a thing that, that, that I uh, was going to aim in on. C still keeping on this person of Jesus and still keeping on this. And so, Colossians chapter 1, mm -hmm. to me, is one of the greatest um, declarations of Jesus as God and, and, yeah. and, and, and his position. I... I think to say I am horrified is not, I know that's an overused expression, but I have to say when I looked at the clear word Bible for Col uh, the various phrases in Colossians chapter 1, I was horrified. For instance, let, let me give you this, and you see, and, and again, coming out of this, this is how I see it. Here is a guy who is a the theology teacher, professor, at an Adventist college, and this is what he writes. So for instance, Colossians chapter 1, 16, which says, by him all things were created, he changes it to, through him the Father created. So he downplays the person. Verse 15, he is the firstborn over all creation, changed to, he has the right to be placed over all creation. Colossians 1, 18, uh, that in all things he might have preeminence, is changed to, therefore he is worthy to be given first place. And again, Colossians 1.18, he is the beginning, is changed to, he existed from the beginning. Now, each one of those things, in my understanding, has taken this preeminent, uncreated, eternal Jesus and has downgraded him. And I think you will find that that is why a lot of Adventists, including myself, I, I've, I've got a copy of the clear word because it was given to me. I didn't, I didn't buy it. And to be honest, I can't remember the last time I picked it up because I've only ever seen it as a devotional exercise. And you're quoting to me what you've just quoted. I have never read Colossians chapter 1 in the clear word. Mm -hmm. I'll stick with this version. Um, that, and yeah. I can't, you know, I, I would be challenged. I, I would then feel, you know, in terms of that, and I recognize you're saying he's an eminent Adventist theologian, and, and he is, and he's a well-respected, and he's a great Christian. I would feel the need to go to him and say, why did you, in your devotional exercise, feel that you needed to, to rephrase it that way? Because certainly as Adventists, we want to raise Jesus up mm. to the height that he's due, not, not to water it down. So, so yeah. I'm, I, I'm on your side in, uh, on, on this section. Yeah. And, and well, I think I, you'll find the majority of, of Adventists yeah. would be as well. And, 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 but but the, I, I suppose this to me was, was quite... Um, I, I, I suppose where, again where I'm coming from and a lot of our viewers will be coming from here is if a theology professor writes that, is that what he's going to teach in, in the college to, to, to Adventists? Is it, therefore, Victor, that... Many people are Adventists are reading Scripture and with an Adventist view of it like that rather than, as you say, and, and I believe you when you say you want to lift Jesus up. I've known you long enough to, 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 to know that. And I, I but believe what I'm you. saying is not just my personal view on no. that. That is, that is the Adventist view. You mm. know, if you, if you go right up to, to our, our world church president, you know, he, he will say the same thing. Mm. Lift Jesus higher. Ellen White constantly lift Jesus higher. With question uh, mark over and, that. <laughs> and I can't, I can't, you know, I can't speak for Blanco because no. I've never studied under him no. and I haven't read much of his writing. Um, and, you know, you've, you've thrown something at me this afternoon, which has brought you joy because... Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it doesn't just bring me joy. I'm, I'm not trying, you, and you know this. I, I'm not just trying to trip you up. Um, but again, 
I think I've said already, but the, the two things that I want to, number one, I want to find out what Adventists believe, but number two, I want you to understand when we get these emails, why we get them. When people read that, and yes, some, you know, I, I've actually read on some websites they're saying this is an official Adventist Bible, which I totally no. agree it's not, absolutely agree it's not. But it was, and even if it's the, as you say, it was the devotional writings of the, theology, the theological professor. But to say things like that, he must obviously believe that. Now, where, where does he get that from? Where, where does that come from? If he's an Adventist and teaching in an Adventist college, where does that sort of thinking... I, I, I know you can't answer specifically for him, but have you any idea where that sort of thing comes from? Well, I, I, I can't answer specifically because I haven't sat and studied his, his teachings. Um, and I suspect that if you did sit with him, and, and you know, this this may be the thing for you. I, invite him on your program. Yeah, I, I, and, I, yes. You know, yeah. get him get him on on Skype. Yeah. Or invite him to Malaga. He, he'd enjoy the coolness here after the heat of Tennessee. <laughs> um, he is a genuine Christian gentleman. I I know that. And I suspect that if you get him in your studio and you talk to him, and I think you know, we've probably gone as far as we can on that yeah, particular point, yeah, that he he will argue for the supremacy of Christ as well. Why he's interpreted it that way in that chapter, mm. I can't answer. Mm -hmm. But I know as Adventists, we hold Jesus as supreme. You know, he's he's the author and finisher of my faith, and and that's where he's going to stay in my mind. And so Jesus to you is holy God. Indeed. And when he was on this earth, he, he, was, he, he was fully God and fully man. Fully God and fully man. And, and you know, you'll see the Desire of Ages saying that again and again. Mm -hmm. And you know, she, she describes it as a mystery, uh, which it is. Yes. But we certainly... Okay. Yeah. So even though within, as you say, within certain aspects of Adventism and things which... And, and I might well try and get... Yeah, uh, do, do what you say and try and get a Skype interview with him. Um, but as you say, those things are there. But you are saying to us, no, we believe absolutely that Jesus is God, part of the Trinity, deity, fully God, fully man. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Let let, let let's leave that there. Um, again, we see there why people can 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 question that. I, I want to move on to um, uh, the, the, what is the heart of the great controversy. I, I'm, I'm going to pick it up at Leviticus 16 and for reasons which I'll explain. And again, because of um, what has been said to us and come on yes. in emails. Yeah. You, and I'm very happy for you if, you, if you want to put it into the much wider context, yeah. you p please, uh, please do, uh, as, as far as that is concerned. But basically, in, in, in Leviticus 16, of course, we have the two goats. We have uh, Aziel, the, uh, the scapegoat. And in SDA Believes, basically, um, what you, 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 you show is you, you have these two goats. And, and one of them, of course, is going to be slain. But one of them is going to go out into the wilderness. And, and the actual quote from, uh, from SDA Believes is this, Therefore... In the setting of the sanctuary parable, it is more consistent to see the Lord's goat as a symbol of Christ and the scapegoat, Aziel, as a symbol of Satan. Yeah. Now, I have a problem here, and I know many people have a problem here, because in Leviticus 16, and, and if you look at Le Le Leviticus 16... Uh, 21 and 22, what you have there is an Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat, okay, and confess over all the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to all their sins, and he shall lay them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who stands in readiness. And the goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities. If that goat pictures Satan, mm -hmm. what 
the accusation to the Seventh-day Adventist church is concerned is when you follow that through, you are saying Satan takes away our sin. Okay, I, I think you're misinterpreting what Adventists are trying to say there. Okay, I'm, I'm fully open to hear from you. Of, sir. of those two goats, which one is slain as a sacrifice? The, 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 what, what, when you, what do you mean? I mean, the first you, you've one... You've got Azazel and you've got the other goat. Yes. One of which Adventists say represents Christ, the other represents Satan. But, but, Only one of them is sacrificed. Yes. Only one of them is blood slain. Yes. And it's the slaying of blood which brings the forgiveness of sins. That's representing Jesus and what Jesus did on the cross, what Jesus is continuing to okay. do for us yep. right now. Yeah. The other one. Yeah, but that's the scapegoat. Yeah. But and the scapegoat was not slain as a sacrifice. Okay. And exactly. you say this scapegoat. You've, okay. got, you've got two goats in this, in this yes. passage. Yeah. The one is slain as a sacrifice, yeah. representing Jesus who takes away the sins of the world. Amen. The other one, according to, to our interpretation of it, yes. and, and again, this isn't one, one that's going to keep you in or out of heaven, uh, but our well, interpretation... It might, it might do if, if you actually follow it through <laughs> if, to its end okay. conclusion. <laughs> Let's see if you convert me by the end. <laughs> but the, the other one is representing the person who brought, or the entity that brought sin into the world, that in Genesis 3, verse 15, you know, you, you have the serpent there tempting yes. the first human beings and causing them to sin. You have him then fighting. This is where the great controversy comes yeah, in. Yeah. You have him fighting Christ the whole way through Absolutely. salvation history. You, you have Revelation chapter 12, where you see it climaxing in the center of the book of Revelation, the most important chapter in the book, some, some would say, where you see the dragon was wroth with the woman and, and you see Satan fighting in heaven and being cast out of heaven and you know, war in heaven. I mean, that's an incredible thing in itself, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and, and you come eventually, joy of joys, <laughs> to Revelation 20, to the end of the book. And in Revelation 20, Satan is thrown into the, into the lake of fire and, and is gone, hallelujah. Um, and so you've, you've got all of these centuries of salvation history of this controversy between Christ and Satan. And Satan is responsible for all the suffering that we're going on with now, you know, for the problems in Syria that we're going on with now, for, for the situation in, in sub-Saharan Africa, for the trouble we're having in England with, uh, you know, let's not get into English. No. <laughs> but, you know, all that's wrong with the world, he's responsible for it. Mm -hmm. So when the when he's, this representation of him is sent out into the desert and is cast out, it's not saying Satan is taking atonement for it. It's saying, you guy, you're responsible, be gone. I, 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 if, if, if that's what Scripture said, I, I, I could take that uh, because that, that, that sounds brilliant. But I think you missed the point. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> See, when the, what Luke 16, 21 and Leviticus. 22... Sorry, yeah. <laughs> what Leviticus 16, 21 and... I'm glad you're somebody's <laughs> awake today. 21 and 22 is saying is quite clearly that this scapegoat, which you are saying refers to Satan, this one... They and the goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to a solitary land, and he shall release the goat into the wilderness. Now, it uses a phrase, shall bear all their iniquities, which is distinctly used in other places of Jesus. But you say that stands for Satan. Some Adventists say that stands for Satan. Now, I, I've had this before, and, 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 and I've spoken to you before, and I've said, you know, that the, 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 the accusation is that Satan plays a part, you, you believe Satan plays a part in salvation. No, we don't. I know you we, don't. He's, he's the cause of needing salvation. But can you yeah. not see that when you say this goat represents Satan, 
And scripture clearly says that that goat shall bear their iniquities. He shall take their iniquities away. Now, there's only one person that can take iniquity away. Who is represented by the goats back in the, the yeah, earlier but, verses yeah, in this Yeah, but we're chapter. not talking about that goat. Yeah. We're talking about this goat, this okay. scapegoat. Yeah. And, and yes, the goat that was slain, absolutely. The lamb that was the slain. That taketh Amen. away the sins sin of, of the world. world. Absolutely. And we rejoice in that. Yes, what, I what know we're you saying, do. What we're saying here, and I, I, I can understand what you're saying, yeah. and I can understand that this phrase is used... In a, in a different context to refer to Jesus in other parts of the Bible. But where the, fru- the, the phrase is being used here is that this goat that's representing Satan is carrying on itself. Well, you know, Satan is. Satan is the cause of every sin that you and I and everybody else has ever done. And when he's chucked into that lake of fire at the end of time, he's the one responsible take all that responsibility with him but it's it doesn't saying. it doesn't mean he he has certainly got no part to play in salvation he spent his time fighting against any salvation right but when ever because if if we're talking about typology and absolutely i mean leviticus is full of typology absolutely with it, okay, yes. yeah absolutely and, and 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 i know often with typology you cannot take every little last detail and say but to me it's what it's quoting there in verse 22 is something that clearly is shown in the New Testament, Jesus actually did. And yet, for some reason, and I, I don't think we will have time to develop that reason in this program, but we will certainly in, in, in a future program, you want to say that that goat is Satan. And yet, that Satan never ever took away our sin. Now you say, but and, this and goat. We're agreeing with you that he wouldn't take away I know, sin. But this goat, no. this one, bears the sin and it takes it away. Now when. He's bearing the responsibility. No, that's not what it says. I'm sorry. It's carrying on itself. Okay. It, it, you see, that, that, that to me is the problem. So it, we may, what we may then have across this table is, is a difference in interpretation of what that goat represents but I think we have a sameness in interpretation that Jesus Christ is our saviour and Satan is the bad guy. Absolutely. And Satan has no part whatsoever to play in our salvation. Yes. Now, you can say that absolutely uh, unequivocally and, 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 and I accept that. But do you see why so often... And uh, I, I have to say, I, 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 I accept what you've said because I've talked with many Adventists before. But when I re- went back and read Leviticus again, and I saw that there, I thought, how can they? You see, because for instance, um, you know, J- John 1, 29, the next day uh, John sees Jesus coming unto him and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world not who died for the sin but to take the sin away Hebrews 9 26 but now once in the end of the world have he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice was put away but sin take it the into word the world sacrifices in both of those yeah no well this is not it's a behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world it's well the lamb of God is different to a goat isn't it you see this is where the typology when you start arguing about all the symbols you can get into into trouble. Yeah, but then, we're actually we're, then you've got we're, real we're agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're agreeing on the role of Jesus. We're actually agreeing on the role of sen- Satan. What we're disagreeing on <laughs> is the symbolism here. Well, I, I'm not disagreeing on the symbolism. Mm. I I am disagreeing, and 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 why? Oh, why? Mm. Did Satan ever? Because you see, all all of this, or, or, or as you go through Leviticus. So what, what, All what of you're these saying, offerings, in a sense, then, is that both of these goats are both Jesus. Different aspects of what yeah. Jesus has done. Jesus completely died, yeah. sacrificed completely for our sin. But not only that, he has taken away. As it, now, Satan never took away sin. Even when Satan is cast into the lake of fire... Sin has been dealt with long, long, long before that. Hallelujah for that. Amen. (laughs) Therefore, to say even when Satan is cast into the lake of fire, which absolutely you and I agree is going to happen, to say then that, you know, and the responsibility of all that you've done comes upon you. No, because by that, that is his judgment. Yeah. 
That is well, his judgment. He's taking the consequences yeah. for us. Yeah. Ah, okay. But consequences. Can, 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 can we agree? All right. We 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 disagree on on this verse, but you and I can see that in terms of what Jesus does for us, we are in agreement. You know, he he is the t- Satan has got no part to play with it. Right. And, and please don't try and get me to say that because no, no, it won't happen and Ad- Adventists don't believe no, it. And I, it's I very clear want, they don't believe it. The whole I, of our writings would demonstrate that. I, absolutely. And yes. I don't want, of, and that's not what I want to get yeah. you to say. And, and you know, because that, I, I know that's not true. But I want you, I suppose, to maybe understand mm. why you get accused of that. Because, you see, the, the Leviticus is all about the offerings. It's, it's, it's all about, and each one of those offerings is a different aspect of Jesus. And so all the way through from Leviticus 1, you had different aspects of Jesus. We, we, we had the high priest coming in. And all the way through, everything to do with Leviticus in dealing with it is dealing with, is, is a sacrifice for sin. Okay, and, and, and when it deals with leprosy, it's a sacrifice for sin, etc., etc. Nowhere else in the whole of Leviticus is Satan even seen as potentially part of it. And yet this one place. And I think, I think you do yourself a total disservice, yes. if yeah. I may say that. And when you, again, I'm not referring to you personally, yeah. but Seventh-day Adventism yeah. in doing that. No, I, I, I can understand what you're saying. You know, I, I, again, as when you talked about Michael, this isn't some, I, I can't recall when I last heard a sermon on this because this is a small part of salvation history. It's a small part of that great controversy from Genesis to Revelation, or in, in some senses, if you look at biblical authorship, Job was written before, sure, sure. Yeah. before Genesis was, yeah. and, and, and you look at Job, and the poor guy, you know, <laughs> feel sorry for him, whether he was a literal guy or whether it was a um, theolo- th- philosophical thesis. But you see God and, and, jo- and, and, and Satan arguing there and this, this whole theme is something that, that Adventists have come to see as, as very important. Uh, and the reason that we're living in the world as we are today and the state the world is in today is, is again because Satan is still fighting. Mm-hmm. You know, it was all paid on Calvary, but, and Satan should know because he's read this book more than anybody. He's had more time to read it. He, he should know what the result is coming. <laughs> he wants to drag as many of us with him. And... And, and that's why we emphasize this theme. That, that's why when Ellen White wrote those five books, the Conflict of the Ages series that starts with Patriarchs and Prophets in Genesis and then, then goes through right through to the Acts of Apostles in, in the biblical period, and then the final one that's actually called The Great Controversy, um, dealing with from the fall of Jerusalem through until Jesus comes again. But all of that, the whole aim of it is to say Christ is our salvation. Christ is doing everything for us. God wants us in his kingdom. He doesn't want anybody to be lost. But there's a guy there that's fighting against it. Mm-hmm. And, and we can have a, a danger in Christianity. And, and in some ways, we've watered down Christianity in the 21st century to say, well, you know, Satan's just really, he's not, he's not really real. He's a bit of a bit of a something there in the background he's he's not fighting the battles the way we think he is well you know my bible says that he is Um, and and that's why we take that theme quite seriously and it's why we rejoice you know in in the books of daniel and revelation and in revelation in particular because while that battle is going on the victory is already assured Mm -hmm. and that's my hope that's my salvation you know we may disagree on the nitty-gritty of some bits but Boy, do I rejoice that the victory party is already set up there in heaven. Amen. And, and you know, and all, all of that, I, I, I'd say, because, yes, th- 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 there is. And, and, and th- th- there is this tremendous uh, fight going on. And, and boy, do, do individual Christians know it. And, and we need to understand warfare. And we need to understand our place in Christ. But one of the biggest things I think we need to understand in that is that the work on Calvary is totally and absolutely finished. Now, 
in the next program, I, I, I want to go on and we're, we're, we're going to start looking at the, the, the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary and, yes. and, 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 and other things like that, which maybe once again leads to this feeling, maybe the work isn't finished yet. May, may, maybe there's something more to do. But coming back to, to, this, to, to this one goat... You love him, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I do. And I'll tell you why I love him. Because to me, it is such a glorious picture of what Jesus has done for me. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed my, uh, our sins from us. Okay, Into the depths of the sea, the deepest ocean. And therefore, what I see in this goat, and please remember, the, the, the high priest lays his hand on this goat. Now, Satan was put under the feet of Jesus. That's the picture, as you mentioned, right from Genesis 3, right from when this whole thing started. And I, I loved, I mean, that picture, I agree. But he was put under our feet. In this one, the high priest identifies with that goat. And that goat then takes the sin and takes it out into a far place, into a solitary land, into a place where it will never, ever be found again. Now, that's why I love it, because and, to and, me, and that think, speaks of Jesus. Yeah. And I, I think that's where, where Adventists struggled with it when they were interpreting it, because where, where is Jesus out in a lonely, far place, never to be seen again? Jesus was sacrificed on the cross, mm -hmm. and his sacrifice was complete, and then he rose again in resurrection victory and, it, and it's it's fantastic and I, I think you know I, I I totally appreciate your passion and I, I love it <laughs> and I'm 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 just delighted for the vigor that you have there we just have that difference mm. but the difference is a difference of interpretation it's not a difference in belief and you know I rejoice and, and you rejoice yeah, and, I, I do you know I, I'm, I'm sorry that um, <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we can't do you, you, you don't think we can change Adventist belief today? Can, can we? And, 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 and they can get new light. That in actual fact, this is a glorious aspect of the work of Jesus. That as far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our sin from us. He you, has removed our <laughs> sins that distance and further. Yeah. And, and, and in that, we we rejoice. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I am sure all the great and good in Adventism are watching this discussion right now and probably sending me emails as we speak <laughs> and saying, Victor, you should have said this to Doug. Yeah. <laughs> now, and, and I think, okay, uh, let's, we're, 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 we're nearly at the end of, 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 of this particular program. So l l let's come down and uh, we've arranged and we've disagreed um, on, on, on this particular aspect. What... You have clearly declared today uh, is the truth, is, is, is that Jesus is almighty God um, and uh, fully God, fully man. No question over that. Um, even when you say he's Michael the archangel, you are not saying he is a created angel. That, that, that's how you would see it. His work is totally and absolutely finished on Calvary. And sin has been totally dealt with. W w would you say sin, that? Sin was, was clearly defeated at Calvary. That's, that's where Satan lost his victory. That's when the veil of the temple was split from top to bottom. And you know, for the first time, the general public could see into the most holy place. Because you know, suddenly, directly with God... Uh, of course, salvation history didn't finish at Calvary because we're still here. Amen. We're, we're still waiting for we're the second we're, coming. We're and working it out, of course. Yes, we're yes. working it out and, and, and we're looking forward to Jesus coming again. Yes. Um, so, you know, clearly Jesus still has a role. He's, he hasn't given up. He's not just sitting there thinking, oh, well, when is the day when Doug and Victor will be ready? <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Jesus is still on my side in heaven. Yeah. He's, he's still, you know, doing, in, interceding for us. It's wonderful. I'm, I'm so glad. I've got an elder brother, as Hebrews puts it, an elder brother up there who understands the struggles I'm having mm. because he's gone through it personally himself and he's God. Mm. Wow. Fantastic. Mm. And that's what he's doing now. Boy, isn't that good news? <laughs> it, it, it is good news. <laughs> and we're going to pick it up there next time. This completed, total, 
finished work of Jesus. We're, we're going to pick that up and see, okay, there are some, still some aspects in the teaching of, of Adventism that I know for some put a question mark over that. And that's where we will pick it up uh, from there. But uh, for, for now, Victor, thank you so much uh, for, uh, <laughs> for sitting there, not storming out. <laughs> it's been my pleasure. He's, he's uh, got me chained. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we will uh, we're, 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 we're pick it up next time. And thank you for watching. Please do take hold of these issues. I know some of you will still by all means email in. I, I will communicate with Victor on some of those issues. But thank you so much. Keep watching. Keep looking. Be blessed. See you again soon. Bye.